Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Chitheads podcast. My guest today is Gavin Flood. Gavin is the academic director of the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, professor of Hindu Studies and Comparative Religion at Oxford University, and senior research fellow at Campion Hall. He is a fellow of the British Academy. Gavin read Religious Studies and Social Anthropology at Lancaster University and taught at the Universities of Wales and Stirling before coming to Oxford in 2005. His research interests are in medieval Hindu texts, especially from the traditions of Shiva, comparative religion, and phenomenology. Recent books are Religion and the Philosophy of Life, Hindu Monotheism, and The Truth Within, A History of Inwardness in Christianity, Hinduism, and Buddhism. He is interested in tantric knowledge and is currently working on an edition and translation of a Sanskrit text called the Natra Tantra, and a book, A Phenomenology of Holiness. He is the general series editor of the Oxford History of Hinduism. Well, I didn't invite you to speak about Sanskrit directly, but I suppose we will be in indirectly when we explore Hindu monotheism and Shaiva Shakta philosophical theology. And thank you for sending along those two texts that you wrote, one being kind of a small book on Hindu monotheism. You did oh, yeah. that for a series, yes, that's coming out? Yeah, that well, no, it's, it's come up. There's a come out. Cambridge University Press have a series called Cambridge Elements. Mm. Uh, they're just like small essays or big, long essays. On different topics so I did it for that that was they they asked me to write a, something on Hindu monotheism so I thought that was an interesting topic so I did I think it's a really excellent resource I mean it's you know it's it's short and concise I was able to get through it in an evening oh, well <laughs> I mean it's a few a few hours but I was able to get through it and uh, I mean I, I could just see it as I was reading it being a a, a great text to be on sort of a reading list to yeah. give people kind of an overview of, 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 of Hinduism more generally. But you also make a couple arguments that I think are really interesting in the book. But let's start out just talking maybe about why Hindu monotheism. You know, you make the point at the beginning of the book about how Hindu, Hinduism is often associated with polytheism. Um, and, and you, you know, you see this as not completely accurate and propose that Hinduism is, is both monotheistic and polytheistic. So can you start by talking a little bit about that and, 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 and how we can understand Hinduism as both a monotheism and a polytheism? Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, you, you, uh, uh, one, one sort of level of understanding, Hindu, polyth- Hindu monotheism is kind of oxymoron in a way because of all the multiplicity of deities and so on. And yet, if you ask many Hindus, they will claim to be monotheists in some sense. They'll say there's one God and that all these different deities are emanations or manifestations of that one supreme being. And that's that's a theme which has occurred throughout the history of Hinduism. So the Nature Tantra, for example, the text that I'm working on uh, with a couple of colleagues as well is, is, um, is an example of this. It, it, it claims that there's this supreme um, be, being that it calls a shiver, of course, it would do, but all these different um, deities are modes or or aspects of this one being. Uh, they're they're um, uh, uses the the, fr- the phrase occurs quite a lot in this text. Bhava Beda, which they distinguished by the the, the the mode of being, if you like. So it, Bhava Beda could refer to the orientation of the practitioner, the way they want to approach God, if you like, um, in the different forms. Um, but it also refers, I think, to the manifestations of, of, of a supreme reality in these different images and different forms. So Hindu monotheism is the idea that there is a, a transcendent source of all the different deities, as it were. And I think that's a strong theme that has occurred throughout the history of Hinduism, and that has perhaps um, sometimes gets lost, gets a bit lost, you know, in, um, in the history. But it's not, it's a Hindu monotheism, rather than um, and kind of a monotheism in, in, in the sense of the Abrahamic traditions, because there you haven't, in Abrahamic monotheism, if you like, you've got um, God creates ex nihilo, it creates from nothing, creates the universe from nothing. But very often, usually, I think in the Hindu tradition, you've got uh, God acts upon pre existent matter, who is one model, um, or that the um, um, 
the, the uh, God emanates as the world. So the world is is the substance, the dravya, the the material, the substance of God, if you like. So I think there, there's a different kind of monotheism, and. Uh, you, some people might say, well, it's not a monotheism then, that because it's if there's a kind of pure immanence, like say I've been Avagupta's Shaivism, non-dualistic Shaivism, where he speaks about um, the one reality of consciousness, the supreme Shiva is, is consciousness, and the world is Shiva, so the world is consciousness. Uh, that, it's not clear that that is a kind of monotheism, I think, but... Um, yeah, well, that, that, I think that's debatable whether that's a monotheism, but it, it certainly, it, it's certainly a monism of some kind. Um, Actually, that's then, a good point. Maybe, maybe let's let's pause there and and um, because these the two these three concepts might be helpful because you've you've mentioned them a couple of times and you use it in the towards the beginning of the book to sort of distinguish between a few different. Um, aspects of 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 hinduism and you just dis, you distinguish between monotheism monism and and emanationism so for oh, those yeah. who just aren't familiar with these terms and what kind of you know um distinguishes them would you unpack those for us certainly well monotheism the english word monotheism i think it's the idea that there's one god who transcends the universe who as it were creates it uh, mm. monism is the idea that there is just one being in the universe which is absolute power absolute consciousness however you however you want to describe it with which we 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 all beings are identical at some level well there's a there's a there's two versions of it i think well yeah there's a, a strict monism in which you are that you are identical with that absolute reality and there's a kind of weaker version if you like in which the um which I call emanationism, is which the world is an emanation of that reality. So they're both kinds of monism, but one is an identity monism, if you like. I, haven't, I just coined that phrase, an identity monism, and the other is a, an emanationism in which the world is an emanation of that one reality. So there's an image sometimes used in, in tantric texts like the, um, the Jayakya Sanghita and also in Shaiva texts, as, as sweets are a coagulation of sugarcane juice, so the world is a coagulation of the absolute reality. So that's the difference, I think, between emanationism and uh, pure monism. And, and the idea, uh, it seemed to me as I was reading, is that you find all three of these in, in various ways in, in the history of Hinduism, is that correct? That's right, you find all three in the history of Hinduism. If I could stick my neck out, I think I would probably say that Emanationism is the is a predominant kind of form of of Hindu thinking. Mm. Yeah, you you kind of land on that conclusion that that what what distinguishes, um, as you say, if you put your neck out, <laughs> uh, Hinduism as a monotheism from other monotheistic traditions, it's this emanationist um, quality. Are, are there any other kind of key ways in which? Um, Hindu monotheism, as you're describing it or defining it, uh, distinguish itself from other kind of monotheisms that go by that word, say, you know, um, Juda Judaism or, or Christianity or Islam? Yeah, well, I, I think the main one is, is the universe doesn't, it doesn't exist before God. God is the first being, if you like, or mm -hmm. who's, who's not actually, a, who transcends being because he creates being, so he can't be... It, God can't exist in a sense because God creates existence. There's that idea. So the um, a purely transcendent being, who's not a say in Islam, who creates the universe from nothing. Um, I think that's a distinguishing feature of um, Abrahamic uh, traditions. It's slightly modified in Christianity because you have the notion of God as a Trinity as well. So it's um, some would argue that the the unity, the oneness of God, is compromised through the doctrine of the Trinity. But they, what they do share is that God is transcendent and God creates the universe uh, from nothing. Now, um, in the Hindu, the, what's, let me speak about the Shaiva, be specific. The Shaiva conception of deity is that God has five functions. God creates the universe, maintains the universe and destroys it over and over and over again. But that destruction and creation is not from nothing, it's from pre-existent matter, as it were. God acts upon uh, Mahamaya or Bindu, Bindu that then unfolds as the universe. 
Um, and these further two functions are God creates, uh, sorry, God conceals himself and reveals himself and the revealing is grace. Now, why would God do that? So the um, Parakya Tantra says um, to that question, uh, God um, does that, conceals himself uh, in order to, um, for souls to, to, to produce the, the results of their beginningless actions, to, to bring their karma to fruition, mm. uh, and they can then be liberated. Uh, the other reason, it says, is because it's the nature of God to do so. It's God's play, as it were. So the nature of, of God or Shiva is this constant outpouring of, of um, creativity and its consequent reabsorption and destruction over and over again. So that's interesting. So I think there are those, I mean, we, the, the Western religions don't have a particular uh, clear answer to that question either. Why did God create the universe as it were? Um, but there is some notion of telos. Uh, but in the Hindu traditions, you don't, yeah, that, another main distinction is that the universe has no beginning and no end. It's a constant recycling over and over again through, through eternity as it were. Uh, but you and I have a telos, we can have an end as, our, as we reach liberation. So I think that's, that's another major. So you've got creation ex nihilo in the West, but you don't have that in, in Hindu monotheism. You have um, beginningless universe, an endless universe in Hinduism, and you, you don't in um, the Western monotheisms. And you have this idea of um, the, the in um, of, of a telos or a purpose to the, to creation, which I don't think you have in Hinduism. There's no purpose to creation as such. It's just the nature of God to do this. But there's a purpose or a telos to individual beings who can reach um, redemption, as it were, who can reach liberation mm -hmm. uh, through the grace of God. Yeah, so you um, you talk about this in the the book about how the um, the story in in Hinduism is is largely sort of a tragic one because you know you're in this um, stew of suffering, but it, it seems to be uh, true also of Christianity, right? Because you know Christianity, you know, life on earth is a fall from grace, and we're all just seeking redemption, and it's like, um, and you know, some would argue that you you sort of pull the rug out from under, you know, your motivation for maybe just action in the world because, you know, this world is already screwed. So, you know, let's just wait till we get to heaven. And it seems like in, in Hinduism, there's this ambiguity a little bit because on the one hand you do have, even in, even in Shaivism, it seems like there are, are different, um, uh, there are teachings where it suggests that you will end up kind of fully resolving your karma and and being fully liberated. Uh, but then there's also the sense that, well, and then you'll go back again and continue this all over. So wh what's ultimately the point <laughs> from a theological perspective? Like if like what's the point of waking up if I'm just going to fall asleep again? Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And these, these it relates to the question of theodicy and so on as well. So um yeah that's that's um so certainly that who, who wants liberation in a sense it, the, the um in shaivism it, it's it, it's uh, it's consciousness that you become you, you don't come back you're not reincarnated again you're liberated so there's no rebirth no more suffering for you um but is it you anymore really i mean this is a, this is a, a question is it is it because the, the, the lower tattvas, if you like, the lower ontic categories of the universe, which make up you and I, like our, our intellect, our ego, our mind, and all the five senses, um, all that uh, disappears with liberation. So where the self becomes, in Shaiva Siddhanta, the dualistic Shaivism, you become a Shiva, you become like Shiva, equal to Shiva, Shiva Tulya, but you don't merge with Shiva. But is it really you anymore? Because... Um, uh, it, it's transcended that that uh, who you think you are, as it were. So mm. yes, that that that's a good question. And um, or the, is it the Vaisheshikas used to think that you, the um, that when you become liberated, it, it's just that uh, you become stone-like. 
So it's not a state of consciousness, but a state of unconsciousness. You become like a stone. So who wants that, as it were? And I think the later Bhakti traditions picked up on some of this and said, I want to taste sugar. I don't want to become sugar. So, um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm hedging your, I'm stancing around your question there, I think, but um, yeah. Yeah, it's a difficult one. I like the idea of thinking of stones as the most awakened beings though. There's. <laughs> <laughs> something quite uh, radical about that. Um, yeah, so, uh, sorry, let me just. Yeah, oh, so yeah, that other question, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I just thinking the, um, so there is in, in um, I think that's a big difference, perhaps that Abrahamic tradition has got this notion of telos, the whole universe is moving towards uh, some Hegelian, if you like, end point. Uh, whereas I don't think that is the case in the Indian traditions, yeah. but there can be an endpoint for you and I, for who can step out of the cycle of suffering. An associated question, perhaps, that is one that is always coming up for me as I, you know, have conversations with people about uh, Shaivism specifically, but I suppose it could be true of other of other traditions within Hinduism. Um, and I actually know there's a, a student who I think works with you actually on a PhD on this very topic of, of how one extracts an ethical perspective from uh, Shaivism. And, and this came up as a question when I was reading in your book, how God is in, in Hinduism, the source of both good and evil. So if God is the source of evil, then what motivates our ability to eradicate evil? And, and 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 I think you know this is this becomes the question for for some people they don't they don't see how to get uh, a social justice movement for example out of a theological perspective like Shaivism. So how do you resolve this, or is it irresolvable? It might be irresolvable, but I think there's a, there's a yeah. I mean, many Hindus would reject that idea that the God the evil comes from God as well. But ultimately, at the end of the day, in a in a monistic world, as it were, uh, it, 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 um, it must do in a sense. And Bhagavad Gita chapter 12, you get this, the Vishvarupa, the, the, the um, universal form of Krishna, the universal form of God, in which he's destroying the worlds and in which he's devouring all beings. And he, he says to Arjuna, yes, you should fight in the war because you can't, you're only killing people's bodies. You're not killing their souls. And uh, so that that's, um, Zeno, uh, R.C. Zeno, the um, Spalding Professor of Eastern Religions before Diwakar Acharya and before Alexis Anderson, says, uh, wrote an interesting book called Our Savage God, in which he argued that monistic, non-dualistic philosophies entail, um, uh, are morally questionable because of this issue, because of this, the evil must come from God as well. Um, so yeah, I think that that I think that must be uh, correct. And regarding social justice, I think you're right. I think it is difficult to have a theological justification for social justice movements on a non-dualistic theological framework. And um, I'll probably get shut down for saying that, but it seems to me that that's the the logical consequence of that position. You know. Um, yeah. Uh, or, or you, or you have to relativize it. You say, well, yes, uh, uh, you know, we have to have social justice in this world, but at the end of the day, ultimately, everything, everything comes from God, or goes back to God, or is, is um, goes back to this unity or this oneness. Mm. In which case, then, um, one one action is is as good as another. It, I've I've been Avagupta in the Paramata Sara, the um, the essence of um, supreme truth, or something. In one of his um, verses, I think it's verse 70, he says, um, it doesn't matter if you kill a, a thousand Brahmins, he says, uh, because ultimately there's only one consciousness. So, I mean, that's a morally questionable position in a sense. Yeah. Uh, but it is a logical consequence of, of, a, of a pure monism. Yeah, I mean, it's a similar reaction comes when people read the Bhagavad Gita sometimes, right? And I think that's one of the 
justifications were where uh, for reading it as an allegory it's like oh it's just an allegory it's meant to talk about you know the journey of the soul like no you know this isn't a, a sort of um, apologia for murder because you know you'll just be reincarnated into the next life and and so it's fine <laughs> people seem to struggle on that point yes indeed yes indeed well the, yeah I don't think Hinduism has any more difficulties with these sort of the, theodicy questions if you like than Christianity or um, any of the other religions really but um uh, there are certain kind of logics within the within the frameworks and certain things follow from from other things. So perhaps, I don't know, perhaps you need a theism in order for social justice, perhaps you need a, um, a theism of some kind um, in, which the, in which you can differentiate between um, absolute goods and absolute bads, if, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also the, this, the, the tragic, I mean, I think Hinduism has a, has a tragic sense of life. Uh, I think the Mahabharata, for example, is a deeply tragic uh, episode. Um, Bihani Sarkar is a, here in Oxford. She, she's written on tragedy. She's very good on the, on the tragic worldview in, in a Indian traditions. Um, yeah, she's actually one of my, my main um, professors. I'm actually planning oh, to, and she gave, she, uh, she uh, gave that book so that I can uh, prepare. So I'm going to actually uh, interview her on that very topic. Oh, good, 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 good. So I'd like to ask, you know, it seems like a popular angle in um, in religious studies and, and Indology is to emphasize, you know, today the, the kind of differences between the many different Hinduisms. And this seems to be sort of a, a, a maybe a res response, a reaction to um, this sort of perennial philosophy kind of movement within religious studies where where there was this you know um reductive gesture at uh, uh saying that everything is the same in some way which ultimately it was argued privileged one tradition over another because it kind of you know privileged certain uh ideas or cultures and so there you know the understandable response, I suppose, has been to emphasize differences as a way of, of respecting context and respecting um, the, the specificity of different traditions. Um, and so I, I guess one argument would be that, that, you know, why are we enforcing a singularity like Hindu monotheism on something that is, that is rather plural? Um, so, you know, what is your response to that? You know, you, you argue that, that at, at the end of the book that there is a value in talking about, about Hindu monotheism because of what it permits at the level of kind of a comparative or cross-cultural dialogue theologically or philosophically. So can you talk about the stakes behind why you're, you know, yeah. proposing this that you, that you unpack at the end of the book? That, that's, that's interesting. I think, I wouldn't like to think that I was um, sort of ideologically committed to a, a kind of Hindu mono, mon, mon, monotheism or anything like that. But I, I think that there's been a tendency to see in the West anyway, just to privilege Christian monotheism at the expense of other traditions and say that actually Hinduism is just a polytheism or Hinduism is uh, intellectually inferior, if you like, because it has this, doesn't have a notion of a monotheism the way we do. So I suppose part of it is a sort of correct, uh, cor you know, balancing that view out a bit. But um, the other thing is that it is a Hindu monotheism, not a, not a uh, Abrahamic one. So I, I want to, uh, I don't want to present a perennial philosophy, but I, I would want, and I want to respect difference and outline and, um, emphasize the cultural and civilizational specificity of, of thinking and uh, traditions of thinking. But nevertheless, there are overlapping features and commonalities and shared concerns that different civilizations and we as human beings share. Um, so I wouldn't want to adjudicate. What, what, where do you stand from? What, what point do you, how do you adjudicate between um, different metaphysical claims it's a very difficult interesting question but a difficult question so what is your response this is obviously something that is i've heard over time and time again by and uh by different kind of scholars and they're always from the west of course um that you know the word hindu was invented at a certain period of time and and seemingly their point in in mentioning that is that 
somehow this implies that it's sort of a false kind of identity or something, which seemed, which then, you know, especially in kind of contemporary politicized conversations, it's like, oh, there's the West again trying to take away our identity. Um, you know, another kind of colonialist gesture this time in, in sort of intellectual way. Mm. So, um, so can you talk a little bit about that and, and why um, Hindu, which is now, you know, which did of course have a, has a historical kind of um, uh, development, how this is a, a kind of worthwhile category or, or one worthy of, of continuing to investigate. I think that's right. There's, I mean, I, I can't understand people who say well, there's no such thing as Hinduism. So many Hindus say that, but you've got about a billion Hindus, I suppose, who self-identify as Hindu. So it, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a, although it's it's a recent category historically, nevertheless, it's a it's a political and social reality today. So, um, you know, it's all very well for scholars wherever they're from to say, oh yeah, well, there's no such thing as Hinduism and uh, uh, you're, you, you know, you're the victim of colonialism from head to toe, as it were, being mm. uh, the word Hindu being projected onto you. But it's a, it's a, it's a term of self-appropriation, as it were. So it is a, a term, it is a, used now by Hindus. And I, I think we just have to, that's just the reality that we're in. Now, just a, a brief history that I mean I think Hinduism I think I think um, um, Dermot Killini I think uh, shows this it was it was first used by um, Ram Mohan Roy I think the ism was added in, in 1819 something like that but the word Hindu as um, was used by the Arabs I think in Persians I think perhaps in early as the 12th century but it was used by Hindus uh, as a, to differentiate themselves from the Yavanas from the Muslims in Kashmir and Bengal, uh, Alexis Sardison shows that there's a, I think there was a, a Kashmiri historian, Srivara, about the um, 14th century or something who uses the term Hindu. And a little, little later in Bengal, it's used to differentiate one group of people from another. Probably it denoted a certain range of cultural practices like sort of cremation of the dead or certain cuisines maybe, or certain marriage customs. They may have included Buddhists as well, you know. Um, mm. So, yeah, but there is a tendency to reify in the contemporary world the notion of Hindu and Hinduism. But I nevertheless do think, I mean, I wrote a book, Hindu Monotheism, I do think it's coherent to use the word Hindu to some extent anyway in, for the earlier period because there's a certain, um, it's just a shorthand that denotes a certain range or family resemblance of traditions, if you like which are differentiated from say Jainism or Buddhism for both uh, doctrinally, but also in terms of practice as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I wanna actually ask you about that practice in a moment, but just to go back to that point about, um, you know, because it arose at a certain historical juncture, it seemed, the, the argument seems to imply that, that, or maybe it's not even an argument that, you know, because it arose at some historical juncture that that somehow means it's, it's less real, even though, as you say, it's been appropriated by, you know, people who self-identify as Hindus. And you I mean, you could say the same thing about so many, you know, religions. I mean, Christianity sort of emerged out of Judaism. So what, you're going to say that, <laughs> tell Christians that, no, well, actually, you're, you're just Jewish, and you made a mistake, <laughs> misinterpreted <laughs> Jesus' teachings, and, you know, they, you, we, let's just, you know, abolish the Christian church. It's kind of ridiculous when you, when you, Put it in that sense, but that seems to be a bit analogously what's being sort of implied there. Yeah, it's a good point. Yes, yeah, someone probably wished that to be the case. You uh, get rid of Christian, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's the, these things are here to stay. The historical realities, and we have to understand them. And our job as scholars is to analyze them rather than prescribe. I think what what should be the case. Um, but I mean, there is a history. I mean, there is a colonial history involved here. And there is a history of the, the construction, if you like, of, of um, Hinduism in the, in the image of, of the West. I, I mean, that is, that is an argument, but that's, all that seems to me to be saying that it's complicated and that we have to be careful um, when we're studying these things. Like philology, there's a great criticism of philology being a colonial enterprise. It's something I completely reject that. It seems to me quite the opposite, that, that philology is actually 
letting be seen is, that, is the method through which you allow what shows itself to be seen. So if, if, we, if we as scholars at a kind of first level phenomenology, if you like, our task is to allow what shows itself to be seen, philology is a tool through which you can allow the voice of the text to show itself in itself without uh, projection in a sense. I mean, you have to make certain decisions, of course, if some subjectivity comes in, uh, you know, you have to choose one reading over another or something, but um, nevertheless, I think that um, philology is, is, is quite the opposite to a colonial enterprise and is um, a freeing and a um, letting the voice of the other be heard. Mm. Okay, so actually I wanted to talk to you about this, and so maybe let's let's provide a bit of context for those that are, are not sort of as familiar with this history. Um, when you're talking about philology, uh, kind of more classically understood, um, and you're, you know, you were mentioning that it's been considered to be a colonial, colonial enterprise, can you talk a little bit about the history of that and why philology has taken on a bad rap? Uh, well, yeah, I think... Well, yeah, that's, let me. Um, it, it's linked into the notion of that the, the the religion is a sort of Western construction. It comes within the history of the West, in which uh, John Locke, just 200, 200 yards away from here, uh, says, oh, "I've got a good idea. After thirty years of religious war, let's put um, let's keep the the public realm to governance and the private realm put, put religion in the private realm." So there's, he just makes this public private distinction puts religion in the private realm and sticks governance in the public realm uh, and that distinction that religion is not something that we do with our privacy is then according to some scholars projected onto the rest of the world like according to india and china and uh, you know that there's, there's no religion in china so as, or my one one of my colleagues says there's no religion in india <laughs> um, but it just depends on what you mean now, now it, are they just definitional squabbles? At one level they are, but at another level, I can see what they're getting at. It's about power and that the colonial, the, the, the viewpoint that philology is a colonial enterprise is about Western power and colonialism and that we impose religion onto people that we've historically dominated. And that it's now time to redress the balance as it were, to question that. So I can understand that where it's coming from. And philology was considered to be a tool of the colonial oppressors because it's Western scholars going out and studying Sanskrit very often with um, in, with the pundits, Indian pundits who were not recognized in their work. And so I, I can understand that it's all valid criticism in a way, but I don't think you should throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that the heart of philology is 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 a, is a is an honest um, honest sort of um, enterprise of of trying to understand the text in its own terms and to understand the civilization through its own language and letting it speak for itself. Mm. Um, so I, I think that that dom that 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 aspiration and indeed I think it's a reality dominates over any cultural hegemony that philology has been used for. Mm. Now, presumably, you're making this point because uh, for a kind of renewed attention to philology that you associate with kind of it being a practice of phenomenology and um, in the classic sense of letting the things show themselves and kind of a quite Husserlian sense, I suppose, um, that uh, you, oh gosh, I just dropped, lost my train of thought. One second. Oh, yes. So you presumably make this argument uh, about a renewed philology because I would presume that you you see there to be some sort of circumstances on the ground that um, would necessitate this this more uh, this renewed approach to philology. So if you could be the the critic, the academic critic for a moment, what are the the circumstances that have sort of inspired you to to um, offer this as a as a as a mode of inquiry? I think partly, well, probably two things. One is the um, decline in the in Western education, if you like, of focus on language and so on. And mm -hmm. um, 
certainly Sanskrit, but the Latin and Greek and the classical languages, uh, I'd like to see taught more and uh, at school level and so on. Um, or German, you know, you don't even get German in schools anymore. And um, so I think, that, that, of course, philology, what's philology? Philology is the study of language uh, and, uh, and the text that, that, that and the texts that the, the cultures and civilizations produce. So, and, and language is, 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 that it is that which distinguishes different cultures from each other in a way. And so it's terribly important because it defines human reality, defines who we are, uh, but it also defines our differences in some sense. So it's terribly important to study language and um, in order to understand human difference, but also understand mm. human commonality as well. So that's uh, one motivation, if you like. Uh, another motivation is um, the, the, the um, it, it gets, it allows us to get at truth, I think. And there's a lot of political use of Hinduism in India, uh, which is going, moves away from truth. I don't want to be too controversial, but it seems to me that um, rewriting Indian textbooks and so on in, um, I can understand the, the motivation against colonialism, but then just to distort it in a different way seems a mistake as well. And that, 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 that paying attention to language and text allows a kind of a certain truth to come through. And if we're attentive as scholars to that truth, then that's, that's, that, that's more conducive to a, a, a solid or real understanding of the world. So I suppose there's yeah, those two motivations. I would want to highlight philology as a first level phenomenology because of the, the centrality of language in human reality mm. and the way in which attention to language can reveal truth. Yeah, I really love that. And you know, it's interesting. I, uh, we, I was mentioning before we started the interview that I'm you know, in the MPhil in classical Indian religion, which is um, perhaps more so than I realized when I applied a pretty classically philology, philology program, and it's very much focused on study of Sanskrit, and I've had to just surrender my attempts at reading any secondary literature at this time, <laughs> because I have to focus on the Sanskrit, which is great. But it's also cultivated a, a sense of I actually am now desiring for the first time in my life studying Greek and Latin, um, partly because the program itself sort of presumes a prior knowledge a little bit that I've had to sort of, um, I've had to uh, surmount that obstacle of not having as much of a background in, in classical languages. But it's really just as you're, you're saying, I, I feel like the more I'm sort of in this environment, the more I'm, you know, realizing or, or seeing the value of the study of, of classical languages. And, and I suppose there is this sense in which classical languages seem sort of like a an elitist old practice that has no relevance because you know how is that going to apply to my um you know how is that going to apply to the contemporary world i mean how many jobs am i going to get in latin <laughs> uh so but it does seem that it's actually quite radical when you think about it because it it, it provides a foundation of i mean there's so much rigor necessary in the study of language so it's you know it's a it's a tool for the development of critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. And then it also does provide uh, some sort of um, foundation or, or shared kind of cultural ground that perhaps, you know, maybe I'm uh, putting my neck out here, <laughs> but perhaps it's too much to say that, that it's that a, a lack of that or a lack of something like the shared study of languages is what's leading to the divisiveness in our culture. Um, but it, it does seem like there's 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 less and less of this shared uh, cultural education system that might provide I don't know some sense of a of a shared foundation. What do you think about that connection? Does that make yeah. much sense? Or it makes perfect sense to me what you were saying. Uh, that I, I completely sort of um, sort of uh, uh, yeah agree with what you're saying there, Jacob. I think it's the um, that there's a that there's a shared um, yeah there's a, there's I was thinking medieval Europe, I mean, although they were all sort of killing each other in wars and stuff, there was nevertheless a shared, Latin was the lingua franca of the educated classes of the, of the church and the monastics. And so you get Dun Scoters coming down from Scotland, studying here in Oxford, and then going off studying, you know, teaching in Paris and going off to Cologne. And, and so there was a whole network of, of um, an international language of, of Latin, uh, but, um, 
of shared ideas and a shared um, uh, worldview, if you like. Same with Arabic in the Arab world, same with Sanskrit in India, amongst the educated um, elites anyway. So I think that language and the study of language does provide a certain cultural basis, uh, which we seem not to have any anymore, particularly over here, where we don't learn other people's languages much. I mean, I mean, not most schools don't teach languages. I don't, I don't know. I may have, I'm speaking out of ignorance here. I'm afraid, but um, seems to me that there's a, a, you know, language teaching is going down, which is a shame. Mm. And, and particularly the classical languages. I wish I'd have got taught Latin and Greek at school. And I didn't, and uh, so my language work has been um, has been a catch up, really. Um, but. Um, Oh, so well, that, I'm glad to hear that, it's, uh, that I'm not alone in the catch-up no, 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 right. <laughs> game. Playing we're, the catch-up game. I'm a little bit cross about that. I mean, when, when kids, their, their, their brains just like, you know, can absorb so much. But if they don't get taught this stuff, they're not going to learn it. And it seems um, that it's, it, it's, um, it's such a shame that you could teach so much to, to young brains, uh, it, yeah. particularly languages. And that doesn't happen. And it, say, oh, well, what's the point of teaching Latin and Greek? Well, in a sense, what's the point of teaching mathematics? I mean, not many people have actually used mathematics that much in their, in their um, working life. They're not going to get jobs as mathematicians. But nevertheless, it's been foundational for, for what they're doing. I think the teaching of language is like that, too. It's, it's a discipline that teaches you how to think, and it teaches you mental habits, which are mm -hmm. good. And it makes you understand language itself. Yeah. Yeah. I sometimes, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a mature student as, as they like to say here in the UK. <laughs> and, um, and I'm in, I'm in class with quite, quite a few people who are, you know, quite young. And, and I actually do feel sometimes I'm like, wow, they have absorbed that so much more quickly. Like they got, you know, we walked into class at the beginning and, and they were sort of, you know, at zero presumably in terms of their knowledge. And then, and the, the speed at which they were able to accumulate <laughs> the knowledge of language. Whereas I'm just like, ah, really struggling, especially with memorization of vocabulary. That seems to be <laughs> memorization seems to be sick, something that I am not uh, as good at as I used to be. That's right. Yes, it makes you sick. <laughs> but uh, that's what well, young brains are, youngsters are. are that's what happens. That's that's the, that's the physiological truth, I suspect, of, of our of our species. Yeah. So okay. So now I want to talk a little bit about actually. It, well, it relates to what we've been talking about in terms of philology, um, and and connects to something you were saying previously about practice. And one of the things that you've you suggested in your a book on Hindu monotheism and also um, things that others have, have suggested in, in other articles and texts is that Hinduism is better thought of as an orthopraxy instead of an orthodoxy. And, and so I guess when we are reading like, well, what, you know, I, as we're trying to talk about sort of the, the theology of Hinduism, I was, ref, I was sort of, you know, in the background reflecting on how we're trying to make coherent all this doctrine, right? We're, we're trying to sort of uh, make a philosophical sense of it, um, which does seem, seem to be perhaps, is this a part of sort of the Western kind of approach to things is that we, we want these things to just kind of fit together intellectually when really what ultimately it's about is, is practice. And, and here we are trying to kind of make sense of all the doctrine. And of course there was that gesture philosophically to make sense and there's a history of philosophical and theological debate obviously throughout Indian history. But you know, what is the, what is the, the meaning of, of Hinduism as, as being fundamentally an orthopraxy rather than an orthodoxy? Yeah, it's a really interesting point. I think, um, I think it's true. I think it's true of probably most religions that it, 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 it's an orthopraxy. What you do, I remember Fritz Stahl wrote somewhere, it's uh, Hindu isn't defined by belief, but by, by the social um, context, the, the, the kind of family they're born into and what they do, what they, what they practice. And I think he's probably correct there that um, um, a Hindu is not so much a, um, a belief system but is um, is what you do that de that defines you, as it were, and uh, your your what does that mean? That means um, 
certain cultural practices, certain foot more forms of ma marriage, if you like, certain cuisines, perhaps certain, but also worships, puja, doing, making an offering to a deity and receiving a blessing as a kind of st fundamental structural unit of Hindu practice. Um, and then on top of that, you could have other kinds of things like practicing yoga or meditation in order to gain spiritual insight or liberation. But I think you're right. I think these, it is an orthopraxy rather than orthodoxy, because uh, you could believe what you like, but, but it's, it's what you do that really defines you, I think, more. So, for example, in Shaivism, you've got Shaiva Siddhanta, which is theistic and um, dualistic, so that you and God are completely ontologically distinct entities. And then you've got non-dualistic Shaivism, which is monistic, uh, in which you are that reality, you are the, that pure consciousness, but the practices are the same. You, the Abhinav Gupta completely assumes the Shaiva Siddhanta dualistic um, practices of initiation and, and Shaiva ritual and so on. So I think that's, that's correct. I suspect it's also the case in, the, in the most religions too. So you go to Christian church and people are practicing and it's, that's the practice, the taking of the sacraments that defines them in a sense. Uh, they, they might well have not much idea of the theology behind it. And, you know, what does the Trinity mean? Three and one and one in three. I mean, <laughs> who knows? But um, nevertheless, it's, it's the practice uh, with, of the community that, that you follow, that you participate in. So it's a, I guess it's a participative mode of um, understanding religion. I think it's, that's perhaps slightly distinct from the note, the category, coming back to an earlier point that we were making, the category of religion develops out of a largely Protestant view, I think, of the category of, of religion as belief, as it were, which is Locke's thing, you know, is do you believe what you like in your interiority, in your privacy? But it's um, probably for most people throughout the world, it's, it's less about belief and more about practice, what you do um, that defines your kind of religion. Which seems to be, I mean, um, you know, not to place judgment on on certain ways of of conceiving of religion, but it, when when you take belief out of the equation, it seems to lead to a lot less violence and 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 um, and division. Because you know, when everything is about whether the sanctity, you know, the relative sanctity of one's beliefs, then it's just like a recipe for creating enemies. Because sure, surely, if we've learned anything that you know people believe different things <laughs> and the centering on on practice is perhaps more of a unifying kind of approach to religion that's a great idea yes that's right so the focusing on practice is perhaps more unifying than the focus on belief because people do believe different things the problem comes when you, when some, one group thinks that what they believe is um what everybody else should believe as well because it's the yeah. truth or it's uh, and then they try and impose that on everybody else and that's where you get problems so. Yeah. So to take the, the, the sort of, I guess, orthopraxy or just practice lens into the study of texts or first level phenomenology, one thing that comes up, I guess, oftentimes in conversations around what we're interested in at embodied philosophy, which is sort of this dimension or intersection of the scholar practitioner and, and whether or not one can truly understand the knowledge of a tradition without the experiential you know, unfolding of that knowledge through contemplative practice or meditation. So when we are reading a text and we're wanting it to show it, itself to us you know, in this kind of classic philological sense, to what degree do you think we also need to engage in the practice as a way of cultivating, I don't know, the body mind to be able to see, to be shown uh, those those concepts um, that are kind of, you know, that we find located in the text. And because, because, you know, it seems that in terms of academia and we're, you know, sitting at Oxford and the, the most sort of classical uh, representation of, of Western academia, um, it, it, it's not really permitted, right? It, there's not a, there's not a, there's not a sense in which it's, either permissible or you know it's at least taboo to 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 suggest that one needs to for example engage in shiva shakta meditation to be um a shiva shakta philologist that's an excellent question and it's one which i uh, have thought about and have come haven't really come to strong conclusions about but i do think that 
um, practice or field work, if you like, does have um, a, a bearing and can sh throw, uh, throw light on, on text. So just an example, there was some medieval sh text, I can't remember what it was now, but it, it was some obscure practice and I couldn't quite work out what it was. And um, then I came upon a practice of um, a yoga practice of blocking one nostril off, breathing through the nostril, blocking the other one off. And um, it, it seemed to be describing that. Once I, knew, once I knew that practice, you could then see what was happening in the text, as it were. So that's an example. Or another one, um, um, Buddhist meditation. Uh, in, um, you know, the Buddhist meditation text, I've got this idea, say, Buddha Gosa's uh, Path of Purity. Uh, the Sudhi Maga, you go up through these eight, four jhanas, four um, absorptions, uh, and then you go through four formless absorptions, go back to the fourth absorption, and the Buddha gets enlightened from the fourth jhana. So now those meditation texts, they speak of the jhana factors, the, the things that have to be present in the mind, in order for um, what's called a nimitta, nimitta means sign, to arise in the mind. And you think, what on earth does this mean? But um, meditators, meditation practitioners, they sit there meditating for an hour's end, and then you get a kind of image, an, an, like an after image in the mind's eye. And that seems to me that's an example of the way practice uh, allows you to understand the text. So you, when you're reading about this nimitta, you think, oh, that's what it is. It's an, it's an inner sign ar arrived at through a meditative practice. So I think there is a truth to that, that um, meditation practice can throw light on the meaning of these texts. And it's not surprising because we're all human beings, we all share a certain physiology. We've all got, um, there's a certain materiality that constrains us. And so it doesn't surprise me that this shared materiality uh, will be reflected in, in the texts that we read. So this has been a delightful conversation. I, I do want to touch briefly on, on something that's going to steer us a little bit away from the, the trajectory of what we've been talking about, but I just want to talk about it because I'm particularly interested in the 12 or the 13 Kali's. So the other article, we've been talking a lot about Hindu monotheism um, for those uh, that have been listening, which is um, a short book that uh, Gavin has written um, for a series uh, from out of Cambridge, I believe you said. And then another article I read for this um, before to prepare for this interview was one on Shiva Shakta meditation, in which uh, Gavin speaks about um, obviously Shiva Shakta philosophical theology, specifically related to the um, the twelve. I, I had known it really as the twelve Kali's, but you thought talk about it as the thirteen Kali's. So can you talk about you know the 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 significance of this? It's like what you know twelve so many goddesses. Like what is the what is the theological significance of these and, and how does it connect, I suppose, to um, uh, the Shaiva Shakta meditational practices as, as you describe it in the article? Yes, certainly. It's really interesting. It was Alexis Sanderson who first drew my attention to the 12 or 13 Kalis uh, and in his work as well. Uh, Abhinav Gupta speaks of, um, um, well, there's a tradition called the Krama, which is a goddess-focused tradition, and that was the heart of Abhinavagupta's um, system, as Alexis shows. And um, he speaks of these uh, 12 Kalis, which is inherited from the tradition, and he maps these onto stages of the development of consciousness. So consciousness emanates out from its source and contracts back in, going back to our beginning conversation. And... Um, this, if, this is, happens in a cosmic level in the emanation of consciousness and contraction through, through a cycle of, 30, of 12 stages back into the 13th. Now the 13th Kali, Kala Sankarshini, is the nameless one. It's, 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 the, um, the, um, it's a bit complicated, the Krama system, but you've got these different cycles of procedures and processes, krama is gradation, if you like. And the 13th Kali is pure consciousness, pure unnameability, the, the anarchia, the nameless one. And uh, these emanations come out from that and contract back in. So it happens cosmically, but it also happens in you and me in each moment of our awareness. So mm. um, there's, a, there, there's a pramatri, the, um, the, the subject of consciousness, 
emanates out as the object of consciousness or the means of the means of knowing and then the object of consciousness and contracts back in so this is a cycle over and over again that according to this tradition you can become aware of through this meditational practice if you like um, and so that's really that's the that's the idea that there it's it's a it's a personification of processes of awareness uh, the way we in an idealistic system where there's consciousness only, where consciousness projects its, its apparently external reality and contracts it back into itself. And the last one is almost like a black hole in which consciousness becomes aware of itself, being aware of itself. Uh, and um, as a kind of a, the, the, the complete absorption of consciousness within itself. Mm. So that's, that's basically what the 13, cycles of, of the of the of the krama meditation are um do you have any theories as to why the you know you're saying it's a it's a personification it's um it's an illustration of what ultimately is is not personal at least in this particular non-dual tradition it's an expression of of consciousness expanding and contracting. Do you have any theories as to why then we need the 12 Kalis to, to symbolize that? Why do we need a personified image to, to essentially um, express something that, um, that is, that is non-personal? What need does that fulfill? Interesting, inter deeply interesting question. Why, yes, why bother with the language of the, of the, of the Kalis? Why not just stick with the, as a Buddhist do, I suppose, with the language of consciousness? Um, well, I suppose one response to that question is that that's the, the language of the tradition, is that these Kalis are um, coming out of the tradition. Another response might be, well, perhaps it's in some kind of existential reality that they're confronting. The, the, um, why, why the ferocious goddesses, too, the, the, the Kalis who are devouring? Um, so it's the destruction of, of our usual experience, I think it's emphasizing, which is personified in the Kalis. But why, why it's personified in that way is, is a, I think that's an anthropological question in a sense. It's a, the nature of who we are. We seem to, is it, is it, is it projection? Is it, we, we project um, personality onto these processes? Um, that's an interesting and difficult question that I don't have an answer to. Um, yeah, it sort of wonders, it, it makes one wonder if, you know, it's, it's almost like um, in some sense a pragmatic, um, uh, way of approaching these things because you know, like you're suggesting, because we we connect more with with things that are personified, yeah. um, that 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 it helps us grasp onto it a little bit more. The process. That's right. It's, I think that's that's right. We we can grasp onto it more easily. Another thing about this meditation is, is um, another kind of language they use in the in the krama is the sky of consciousness. Uh, Chidgagana, or, or in other words, too. And that's very interesting, I think. It says that there, there's this, that the nameless one, which is um, beyond all representation, um, becomes the sky of consciousness. So the sky of consciousness is one language in which we can approach this reality. So it's a metaphor. There's a sky up there, and here we are here. Uh, and there's, and if we become open, it uses the word um, open to the sky of consciousness, then that, that, is a trans has a transformative effect upon the upon the human, and that's a, a that's a very deeply interesting idea. I think, especially when you consider the the age of these texts. It's, it's uh, you know, I've been um, um ninth, tenth century, um, a tenth, eleventh century, um, and this maybe goes a hundred years before him, or perhaps two hundred years before him, uh, and it's a very early period in which you've got quite a sophisticated notion there of, of a human freedom in a way, openness to the sky of consciousness, uh, given the very restrictive social conditions in which people were living at the time as well. Um, well, I, I mean, I'm sure you've observed that, that, um, that you know, tantric traditions um, and certainly the Shaivish doctor traditions have taken on um, they're, they become very popular in recent years, um, you know, partly as a result of all of the work that's been done that sort of, you know, um, um, brought these these um, traditions to a more popular level. And they've become very popular within kind of, you know, the spirit, you know, wider kind of yoga spiritual communities. Um, do you have any uh, kind of theories as to why 
these traditions are are undergoing a renaissance like this? Like, why do people, um, why do they resonate with people so much? There's another good question. I think it's to do, as it has the last since the last fifty years or more, it's to do with the secularization, to do with the, the demise of traditional forms of religion. Uh, the, the, there was a, a philosopher, Charles Taylor, wrote a great thick book called The Secular Age, in which he um, mapped out the, the conditions of um, the demise of religion, in a sense, and, and um, at least was traditionally understood. But that's nevertheless, there's still a, a need for these kind of transcendental or spiritual meanings in people's lives. People want to live a meaningful world, uh, and that they seek meaning in these other traditions which have been opened up through contact with the with India and so on. So these traditions have come to the West. Um, and people are, are sort of thirsty for, for spiritual knowledge, I think, um, uh, to put it crudely. And mm -hmm. uh, that these yeah, I know, I, sorry, go sorry, ahead. They, yeah, these traditions fill a gap, you know. Yeah. I was I was at a I uh, I never actually got my I, my first kind of degree was in political theory and I, I was into Charles Taylor for a while and I never made it through a secular age. It came out actually, I think just when I was in uh, at the end of my first grad, grad school experience. And, but does he, is, is the argument, I can't really remember because I feel like it came out sort of before the sort of return of, of religions in a sense. It was, so yeah. is, is his argument that, you know, this is sort of a, that we're moving into a secular age and we're and it's quite healthy or is there a sense in which this return of religion is, is kind of on the horizon? No, I think what well, he thinks, if I remember correctly, he talks about the North Atlantic, the secular age pertains in particular to the North, what he calls the North Atlantic, which is um, mm. Europe and uh, the North, North America, including Canada. Um, and it's a historical process that's been happening for, for many centuries. Uh, but his question, you, he, he defines different kinds of secularism, but the, the third question, if you like, what are the conditions, what are the historical conditions necessary to produce this kind of secularism? And that's the question that he focuses on, um, and he, he claims to give answers through the history of thought and so on. So um, it, it's, it's, it's mo mostly restricted to the North Atlantic, but it, 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 it's such that because we used, yeah, he, he talks about in, in, in the old days, people, the, the boundaries between the self and the world were porous. So forces from outside could come into us and forces from it in, in us could, could go outside. So there's a, a community are in, mutually influenced by each other. Now the modern self is buffered, he says, it's individualistic and buffered and um, uh, buffered away from the cosmic influence. And that's, I think that's very insightful. So in pre-modern yeah. India and pre-modern Europe, the self is, is porous, if you like. The boundaries between world and self are more malleable or flexible. So forces from outside come into us through possession and all that. And um, so the, the North Atlantic has created the buffered self through historical and economic conditions. But now I think that, I think as Taylor would says it, I think somewhere himself, that those, that bufferedness starts to get eroded because of people's desire for cosmic meaning, I think, to put it mm. crudely. And um, mm. that the Indian religions provide cosmic meaning, cosmological significance for people. And I think that's, that's terribly important. We need cosmic meaning in our lives. And the secular age doesn't provide that. And Christianity has gone away from that as well. So perhaps Islam provides it to some extent. Um, Lots of converts to Islam, Cat Stevens, and all those, and um, to, to the Indian traditions as well. I think that I think the Indi Indian traditions claim cosmic meaning, but then you've got a problem, of course. Uh, you, you've got the domination of, of um, certain gurus who claim absolute authority, and that that's a problem, I think. Yeah, because it's irrationality, and it's potentially yeah. exploitative nature. Yeah, that seems to be uh, yeah an ongoing, an ongoing issue. Um, although there has seemed to be I don't know in recent years with the fall of so many gurus, some kind of 
waking up around this and certainly, you know, maybe you could couch that within a larger socio-political uh, waking up. And, and it does seem, you know, to connect it to your point about the porousness, the pre-modern porousness, it does seem like that that is returning, maybe because it's just, you know, makes more sense. Yeah. <laughs> it makes more sense to imagine ourselves in a, you know, in a network of relationships, you know, both with other people. So you have the dimension of kind of the, you know, a, a, accounting for a number of socio-political issues, whether it be racism and, um, and, right. uh, and, and, and that sort of thing. And then on the other hand, also this desire for the, the, the sense of connectedness with, with the cosmos. Mm -hmm. So that porousness is returning both on kind of a socio-political level, but also a, a kind of metaphysical or spiritual one. That's really interesting. Yeah. I think that actually you mentioned my, my student earlier, um, who's doing, um, a, a thesis about this, um, this, the issue of, um, authority and control in yoga traditions, Brett, Brett Paris. And, um, um, yeah, he's raising interesting questions, and and this question of the interconnectedness. I think that that is that's a um, that's a that there is a turn to that. That's kind of a contemporary zeitgeist. I think. I mean, although we, we, we're witnessing all these horrors and so on in the political field, perhaps there's a, a deeper orientation towards the world and nature, and the necess necessity of paying respect to nature and. Um, healing it in some sense. Mm. There's an interesting book that my friend Oliver put me onto called um, Searching for the Mother Tree by Suzanne Simard. And uh, she talks about, she's a biologist and um, teacher at the British Columbia, but she was started out her life as a uh, lumberjack, as a logger in Canada. And that the way that there's an, un, the, the, the forest grows because of an underlying interconnectedness of a mycelium of a fungi with the roots who, and this idea of mutualism that um, they, they feed each other. And maybe that's a kind of metaphor for, um, for a kind of future humanity, if you like, in which we're more mutualistic and more interconnected. Well, that sounds like a beautiful note to end on. Let's, let's, let's hope that we can continue to move into that porous uh, interconnectedness and, and find, our, find our fungi. <laughs> find our fungi. <laughs> Thank you so well, much. Well, uh, Gavin, it's been such a delight to speak with you. And I, you know, I've been a fan of your work for some time. And so it's really an honor to have been able to speak with you about some of your, your recent work and exploring Hindu monotheism as well as, well as some, some Shaiva Shaktism. Is there anything that you'd like to share with the audience in terms of a, a, a forthcoming book, perhaps, book project that you want to get put on the radar of our listeners? Uh -huh. uh, what, yeah, I'm doing, um, well, I've completed it now, but it's, um, hopefully being published um, within within a, a year or so called um, it's a book on holiness it's a phenomenology of holiness holiness mm. politics experience and life that's the title but mm. it's developing this idea of um, what is holiness of of whom is their holiness and of what so it's raising ontological questions it's beginning with a more Heideggerian being in the world notion and this is where we begin uh, and arguing that um, holiness is a, as a proclivity within human beings along the lines that we were speaking about of a need for meaning and need for cosmic meaning and so on. Mm. So when, when will that be published? Probably within the next couple of years. Well, we're definitely within the next couple of years, but I, I couldn't, I don't know, actually. I don't You're know. not sure yet. <laughs> you got to get through it. Um, well, you know, we're here March 2022 for those listening who are maybe listening in 2024. Maybe it will be published and you can see oh, it, see it out. By then, yeah. Hope, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully uh, by the by the end of the year, it'll be submitted and um, hopefully out by 2023. Excellent. Well, I look forward to reading it. Well, thank you so much, Gavin, for your time. Thank you so much, Jacob, for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. It's been such Bye -bye. a delight. I've been speaking to Gavin Flood, who is the academic director of the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, professor of Hindu Studies and Comparative Religion at Oxford University, and senior research fellow at Campion Hall. Thanks so much, Gavin. Thank you. <laughs>